We're so honored to have Bill Drayton, founder of the Ashuka Youth Venture and Lift Up Long Island's partner here today to shed some light on the impact that this movement can have on job creation and innovation. I think it's best to use his own words when describing social entrepreneurs. Social entrepreneurs are not content just to give a fish or to teach how to fish. They will not rest until they have revolutionized the fishing industry. It's my pleasure right now to introduce Bob Chauvin. For those of you who were not here, and there were many of you who were not here uh, during the panel, Bob Chauvin is the president of Tyco Simplex Grinnell, a longtime leader in fire and life safety with 11,000 employees and 150 company-owned offices in the United States and Canada. Through Bob's leadership, they have provided grants to establish United Way youth venture programs in 10 locations, including the United Way Lift Up Long Island just this year. Bob? Okay. Good afternoon, everybody. I'll be brief and get you to the main event. Uh, yeah, I, I have the privilege of, of uh, being the leader of a large company, but more than that, um, I'm a dad and I'm an uh, individual who was inspired by Bill Drayton to create really a program within our organization to really lift uh, the youth of our, of our, really, of our local communities and communities around North America. Uh, you know, it's, it's my honor to introduce someone who was, I would say, well ahead of his time in understanding the importance and the value of social change. Uh, Bill formed Ashoka in 1980 with the vision that everyone can be a change maker. And today, they are the largest social entrepreneur organization in the world with over 3,000 fellows in 70 different countries. You know, Bill's work in founding Youth Venture uh, inspired me to make that a signature program for Simplex Grinnell. Uh, that it's our goal to spread across the 150 locations where we work and serve across North America. But I think just, just a couple of thoughts. Youth Venture allows kids in high school and middle school to be funded for social impact ventures that they take on. And what it really teaches them, it teaches them teamwork, teaches them leadership, teaches them how to plan a business, teaches them empathy, uh, you know, quite honestly, teaches them all the skills that, regardless of where they land, are necessary to be effective change makers in the world today. So, people like Bill are rare. Uh, he creates a vision for a brighter future. He inspires us to do more, and he helps us to really understand the role that social entrepreneurship can play in the world today. And it's uh, my pleasure to introduce uh, my friend and an inspiration to me, uh, Bill Drayton. So um, Bob, many thanks. And many thanks to so many people here at Stony Brook who are building this into a change maker campus. And to Jim and his colleagues who are building the Youth Venture Program across Long Island. Uh, the fact that these things are all happening here now is indicative that they're seeing everyone who's leading is leading, but there's a moment in history. Uh, it's not an accident that these things are happening now. And when one understands the very profound change in the strategic environment that we are just going through, it's incredibly empowering. If you know where you're going, and you also know what the past is, where you're leaving, then you can figure out what to do. So I hope that I can share with you today what we've been privileged to be able to see we have 3,000 of the world's best social entrepreneurs. Over half of them have changed national policy. Three quarters the pattern in their field at the national level within five years of launch. And they're in every field all across the world. We would be blind if we didn't see these patterns moving. So it's a very privileged position. And uh, it has 
huge implications for every individual here, for everyone you care about, for any group that you're a part of, and for Long Island, for America, for any society or group you care about. When a turning point comes, it's almost always a big surprise. Uh, it takes a long time to build up to the tipping point, and then the tipping point is really quick. You study any of these moments, and that's what happens. And right now, most of us are living in the old system, the old world. We have in our heads the patterns of thinking that come from millennia of that old pattern. But as we sit here, this change is already into the tipping stage. So let me give you two examples of what happens when you get left behind when one of these turning points come. It's not pretty. You don't want it to happen to you or the people you care about, or Long Island or the country. Detroit. 50 years ago, it was the top of our technology pride, wealth, and you know where it is today. It's not only technically bankrupt, in the last 10 years it's lost 25% of its population. And they just got a little bill um, saying that of the buildings that remain, 40% have to be torn down because they're unrecoverable. And that's going to cost the city another billion dollars. Um, they missed the turning point. Um, you remember the great Persian Empire, the superpower of its day, caused the Greeks all this trouble? Well, Darius was sitting there at the peak of this empire, and these primitive tribal people in Macedonia came up with the modern phalanx, a new way of organizing, uh, which is the predecessor of the Roman legions. Uh, well, he was unaware of that it, until Alexander arrived on his doorstep, far away from Greece with a smaller force, and he didn't have elephants, and six hours later, Darius was fleeing for his life and didn't make it. That was the end of the Persian Empire. He missed a turning point. And I, would, I think it's pretty clear that we are right now at the biggest turning point that humans have faced for the good, but it's a really big turning point, and you want to be helping lead it. That's a huge human opportunity, and you certainly don't want to get left behind. Um, one thing that differentiates us from Detroit is that we don't have 50 years. The underlying fact that is driving this is that since at least 1700, the rate of change has been escalating exponentially. And that's just a mathematical fact. It's not a, you, you don't have a choice to like it or don't like it. It's just a fact. And that is driving this change. Um, that curve is combined with the number of people causing change, hopefully everyone in this room, and the number of combinations of people causing change. Um, and just think about how much more connected people are now than they were 10 years ago. You know, the World Wide Web is just a part of that. There's another curve that is the inverse. The demand for people to repeat things is going away. Now, that means that if you think you're going to be a bank officer uh, and do loans and supervise people doing loans well, that's an illusion, because that's a repetitive activity. And remember Alibaba? They just had this rather dramatic IPO. Well, three and a half years ago, they launched a lending program. And as of last January, I, I don't, I'm not up to date on the numbers, they had about $3.5 billion of loans outstanding. Maximum loan is $10,000. How many loan officers do you think they have? But imagine any bank you know, if they were making that many loans, you'd have to have quite a few lending officers, and then someone would have to supervise them. Well, there are zero lending officers. And if there's no one, if there's no one lending, then you don't need supervisors. So it's a self-correcting algorithm. 
I give you lots and lots of examples like this. So it's not just physical repetition, it's intellectual repetition. Uh, so this is the most profound change. We're moving from a world organized around repetition and efficiency and repetition. Now the value is contributing to change. This is a completely different game. You have to organize differently. People have to have different skills, profoundly different skills. That means growing up, education, who you recruit, what skills you're looking for, how you run your company so that you're constantly developing these skills, completely different game. So I'm going to come back to that but I, and, and go into it more deeply, but you can't afford to miss this turning point. This has huge implications for everyone here to really be able to contribute in a big way. If there's any young person you care about you better be thinking a different paradigm and help them see it, any group you care about. So what I propose to do is explain a little bit about how we see this, then go into what this change is and what it means so you can get more into it, and then finally come around to what the implications for everyone here is. So how do we see this? Well. Again, it's, it's a privilege of being at the center of this community of really great entrepreneurs. And social entrepreneurs are defined, well, the only thing that defines them is that A, that they're entrepreneurs, which means it's not about direct service, it's about changing the pattern. Uh, and then the word social, what does that mean? It means that from deep within, this group of entrepreneurs is committed to the good of all. Not just the shareholders, not yourself, not an ideological or religious point of view. And in fact, not just the laziness of not thinking through what all the implications are. A real commitment to the good of all. Now, the faster things change, Think about it, the more urgent it is for society to have these people. We used to just assume the patterns, the basic systems of society, but now they're all changing and they're bumping one another. And you have all these other entrepreneurs around, and not because they're trying to do ill, but because the system is not yet designed to serve the good of all. And for whatever reasons, you start losing things that are really important. So right now, for example, privacy is under really big threat. Why? Because we need preventive surveillance. A few people can do an awful lot of damage and you can't afford that. Moore's law, every year, 30% cost of manipulating massive amounts of data goes down. So the czar of secret police couldn't imagine doing what Google or almost anyone can do for no cost. And therefore, you have big data, which is good, but it's not great for privacy. And then the dominant business model is in the, in the digital world is give them something they want, get information, and you sell that. Well, that's not good for privacy. And in each case, the people who are pursuing those ends are trying to do something that's good. Um, but the cumulative effect is not, because privacy is critical for creativity and freedom. And it's one of those deep values we've fought for for a very long time, and it's at risk now. Well, who's going to deal with that? That's an example of why you need social entrepreneurs. When things get stuck, when they're headed off a cliff, or just when there's an opportunity to do something better, social entrepreneurs are absolutely critical to us all. Now, there's another implication of that. Social entrepreneurs think about the whole thing. That makes it easier when you look at the patterns of their work to have a good sense of where society needs to go. And that's just a huge privilege that helps us. When you see all these patterns, they fit together around the world. It's a very strong directional arrow to go from the patterns to what the new paradigm is, and then to work together to make it happen. 
working together to understand and make it happen is collaborative social entrepreneurship. And that is new. You say the word entrepreneur, you think one person alone upsetting everyone around them. Um, here, in this case, we have 750 fellows focused on children and young people working together to figure out what the new paradigm is and then how do we actually tip the world to make that happen. And that's dramatically more powerful. Uh, and the world really needs that. Uh, and you think about, uh, once you begin to see those new paradigms, then there's a huge job for the universities in the world. Um, we need new research. Teaching has to change. Writing and consulting. So uh, again, I'm going to come back to that more at the end. But the social entrepreneurs working together, seeing patterns, it's very helpful to see the larger picture. Uh, let me, if I may, quickly jump now to what is this change? And please let me give you a little bit of history. From the end of the Roman Empire to 1700, there was zero growth in per capita income in the West. And then in the 1700s, it went up by 20%, the 1800s, 200%, and the last century, 740%. So something happened around 1700, a change in the structure. And I think it's pretty clear that was the beginning of the everyone a change maker world. Business said, if you've got a better idea, if anyone has a better idea, and you make it work, we're going to make you rich and happy and respected, and we're going to copy you. And the engine of self-multiplying and uh, group multiplying change got underway. And the key, the key word there is anyone can do this. Um, so that didn't apply to the citizen sector, but around 1980, which is when we set up and why we set up Ashoka at that point, it suddenly became the new pattern of competition and entrepreneurship for the citizen half of the world's operations. It is impossible to remember the squalor of the citizen sector. When I graduated from college, absolutely no one was going into this field. Um, it was pathetic. Uh, and then you know, we just fallen farther and further behind business and the pay and the organization and the morale and the impact was very, very slight. Uh, why? Because this new wealth, government could tax it. People didn't even notice it going away because it was new wealth. You weren't reducing people's incomes. They were still going up. And then the government paid for these services and a monopoly. That government doesn't have to be a monopoly. It just has set it up so that way for historical reasons. Well, monopolies can't stand competition. And so the people with the payroll said to the citizen sector, don't compete. Well, if they had the payroll, so we didn't. And that's why it's a very strange historical phenomenon. But over the last 35 years, the citizen half of the world has caught up. A dramatic increase in productivity, scale, and now globalization. That in turn means that the barrier between them can come down because we're now operating on the same, at the same level. Well, that's part of that, you know, that curve of change going up. Well, when you have a half of society that was out of the game comes into the game, and that spreads in 35 years all across the world, that's one of the reasons that the rate of change is going up exponentially. Uh, so we're now at a point that the way the old system worked is just breaking down. So how did the old system work? You went to school, if you went to school. Uh, one way or another, you got a body of knowledge or skills and a set of accompanying rules. And then the assumption was you would repeat that for the rest of your life. You'd be a barber or a banker, and you would put in a work 
you know, set of walls. And then the idea was you just keep repeating that and maybe you'd get better at it. Um, and as long as there wasn't much change, that was actually a pretty efficient system. But it can't deal with the environment we have now. So just think of the environment that's emerging very rapidly, more and more every year. It used to be that A fits B because they keep doing the same thing. Now A changes and bumps everyone around A, and they bump everyone around them. So change is begetting and accelerating change rather than repetition reinforcing repetition. And that's not just different, that's the exact opposite. Now, the old way of organizing doesn't work over here. You've got your environment, your strategic environment is now everyone bumping everyone else. And you need a thousand eyes. You need every single person in your organization to be looking at the environment around them, which is changing, and understanding it. And then the thousand eyes have got to talk together, think together, and say, oh, well, in this, and, oh, this, this whole pattern change, oh, there's a new opportunity for us to contribute. To contribute in this new way, you've got to build a new group of people, a new team of teams, because you need different sets of skills, different ideas to do a different job for different clients. Um, now, think about that. Someone who is trained to do one thing repetitively all life, how on earth are they going to function over a year? How is the old pyramidal sort of organization with more and more fine stovepipes, think law firm, think assembly line, how is that going to respond to this environment? You can see that you can see the, the half life of any product or service gets shorter every year. That's just another way of saying the same thing. And if you think this is dramatic today, just imagine what it's going to be like in 10 or 15 years. So the new paradigm for organization is fluid. You can't have walls. It's not just business and society. All the walls, internal walls, geographic walls are going away. You've got to be able to pull together the team you need for whatever new thing you're setting out to do with the best possible team. Um, open, you've got to get ideas, people, access, wherever it is. A team of teams is not the traditional organization. Think a basketball team. No one is telling everyone on the field what to do. Everyone, every single member of a basketball team has to be able to figure out, oh, this is what the layout of people at this moment is. I'm going to do this. And that's in the context they know who all the other players are and their strengths and their weaknesses. And they're constantly trying to help one another get better for this play, for this game, for the whole series of games. Well, you need that. You need to have everyone be a change maker. How can you play in a game of change if you don't have change makers who can be part of the thousand eyes and thinking together and building a new team of teams where everyone is initiatory? That's a, this is a completely, and there's one other characteristic. You have omnidirectional synapses from every point. It's no longer a hub and spokes. None of those things make sense anymore. Just think of how the World Wide Web works and why did the web come up at this point? So this is uh, a completely different type of organization and it requires a different type of person. And this is getting close to what the implications for those of you who are students thinking about what are the key skills going forward. Those of you who care about workers or friends or your own skills. Do you have the skills? What do you have to do to do it? So let me describe a little bit what they are. Um, and this is a redefinition, a new paradigm that comes very rarely, but we have to go through this. A good analogy is when 100, 150 years ago, society said, we need everybody, key word, to be literate in written language. Before that, that was absolutely not the case. A tiny elite spoke Latin, Sanskrit, 
uh, Hebrew, whatever, and they had a monopoly on access to God and information, and they really liked that. But it didn't work when society got to a level of complexity. You know, and, and those, those elites hated this. They burned William Tinsdale at the stake in England just a few hundred years ago because he translated the Bible into English. They went and grabbed him in Holland, extradited him illegally. I don't know what, what, what there's some word we use for that today. And then they burned him at the stake. Well, we got through that change, and there's no one argues really about that at this point. We've never agreed about how people get educated. We're constantly trying to figure that out. But the need for everyone to be literate is not in question. New strategic environment, a world of change, not repetition. We all need to be change makers. To be change makers, there are four key skills, and all of us have to have them. And if this generation of children and young people, which is what Lift Up Long Island is working on, does not have these skills, they do not have a future. They will be marginalized. Ditto their families, their communities, and, and we can see that going on around us right now. This is, what, this is an example of why this is so urgent. So the first skill is empathy cognitive empathy-based ethics. And I apologize for these very carefully chosen words. So um, empathy sometimes means I feel your pain, you know, the Bill Clinton thing. Uh, well, elephants do that. And that is important. We have mirror neurons. We have many more mirror neurons than any other species. And it's literal. If I see Bob in pain, I feel pain, because that's what neuro neurons do. Cognitive empathy is, is different, and in fact, when you're using cognitive empathy, you actually don't feel pain. Um, you are consciously, and this is what everyone has to do, everyone has to consciously understand all the people around them, layers out, further and further into the future as the future comes at you faster and faster. And now not in three or four simple contexts, you know, one family, one community, one job, etc. But now in this kaleidoscope of constantly changing contexts and interconnected contexts, this is very complex and it gets more complex every year. Every human being has the physical capacity to do this. We have a cerebral cortex, we have a lot of mirror neurons, but we have to master this skill. This is like reading and writing. Everyone has the physical ability to do it, but you have to work at it. Now, we are denying the opportunity to master empathy-based ethics to millions and millions of children on Long Island, New York, the country, around the world. And they do not have a future. Why? Rate of change is going up exponentially. Well, what does that mean? Among other things, it means that for the first time in human history, you cannot be a good person by diligently following the rules. If you have not mastered cognitive empathy-based ethics, you will hurt people and you will disrupt groups. Why? Because the faster things change, the less of human life is covered by rules. They haven't been indebted yet, they're in conflict, they're changing. And in those increasingly frequent and important situations, you have to make these judgments. And you can't if you don't have this skill. And it just happens in the human life cycle that it's really important for young children to master empathy-based ethics. Uh, they're ready for it, can do it. Uh, then you get into the, when the brain rewires and you have a young person, the second part of the new paradigm is you've got to be a change maker. You can't read a book about this and master it. This is the ultimate bicycle ride. The only way you can be a change maker in life is to be one as a young person and practice it. So Bob gave a wonderful story um, about an 11-year-old youth venture 
in one of the communities in north central Massachusetts where he has been behind the growth of the program. Um, she or he? She. Uh, noticed that a lot of the poor kids in her class would not have a decent meal between Friday and returning to school on Monday. So she now has 300 care packages that she and her friends raise money for, organize, so those kids don't come to school starving on Monday. Now, I, I've never met her, but I've met other young people in this area. And in fact, I, I'll just tell you a story of another of the same age. Uh, we had a meeting of 350 youth venturers in Washington. I sat down at lunch, and this very young, small young woman comes over and sits down to my right. She introduces herself and immediately says, I'm 12, because she's sick of people like me thinking she's eight. Uh, and she then, um, so I said, well, what's your adventure? She said, well, my brother is autistic. And I would cry when I saw kids mistreating him all through school. But now we fix that. Oh, well, how do you fix that? Um, we get together, and this is almost a word-for-word -word direct quote. We get together and we figure out how to go in and fix it. And then we do, and we're very persistent. And you know, by the time she finished that sentence, it was 100% obvious what you had felt when she sat down, that this is a woman who already has her power. She has her PhD about how to be an effective good human being, and she knows it. She's never going to be afraid of anything. She's already brought a team of other kids along with her, and they are practicing empathy-based ethics and teamwork, and they're getting an idea about the new type of leadership. Those are three of the four skills. So I then asked her another question. How many student groups are there in Shirley Middle School, which is where she is? At that point, over 50. Well, we all know that we would be very lucky if America had one-tenth of one percent of its middle schools that had 50 student groups. And this is a result of Bob's and Phil Gawinski's work over nine years, over 16 townships in this very poor part of the state. This is the norm. So when she walked into that middle school, she had a problem. And instead of the environment telling her, oh, you're incompetent, irresponsible, stay out of the way, we do it better, faster, dearie, let me do that for you, the whole environment said, you've got a problem, you solve it, you build a team, look around, this is the norm. And so she did. And I don't know her background, but coming from that community, the probability of her having a privileged background is very low. Um, now, Every kid that goes into that school is walking into an everyone a change maker community. And what we need in Long Island, in Bombay, anywhere, everywhere in the world is every middle and high school, and for that matter, college, must be an everyone a change maker environment because that's the only way every young person is going to be a change maker, have an opportunity to be to become what they have to be, to be a real contributor in society. Now, I have just articulated a different paradigm for growing up. It's analogous to the paradigm that every person must master written language. Change in the environment requires it. The environment has changed, is changing. Any person who doesn't have these skills isn't going to play. If you don't have empathy-based ethics, you're going to hurt people, you're going to disrupt groups, and you are gone. I don't care if you are masterful at astrophysics. If you hurt me, I want you gone, and it's your fault, and it's your group's fault. We're causing that future to happen right now to millions of kids. It's absolutely unnecessary. Uh, Think about the other skills. Um, if you don't have the ability to contribute to change, remember that other curve that's going down exponentially, the demand for people to repeat? 
there are not going to be jobs for bank officers lending money. Uh, IBM says that its new Watson technology is going to do away with 50 to 60 percent of what doctors and nurses do in the next four or five years. Um, we have a 16-year-old, now 17-year-old youth venturer in Seattle who's uh, entering an XPRIZE competition. What he does, God knows how he does this, he puts a patch on your skin and it reads 35 proteins in your blood without causing you to I mean, it does this harmlessly. And it turns different colors, and you take your cell phone, take a picture of this thing, and then it goes to an AI center, and the AI center comes back to your cell phone and says, oh, you better go quickly and have this test done, or don't worry about this. Now, if a 16-year-old, now he's a youth venturist, so he's really special, but if a 16-year-old can do this, this is just off the shelf. So, you know, IBM is not fooling. This is happening. Uh, the New Yorker had a great article, not this summer, but last summer, um, which I recommend to you. It's a great read about um, how an explorer from New York City, I'm from New York, so I love this, um, and a film producer from Beverly Hills, they get together and they go to uh, Honduras, you know, there's this People have been talking about these white golden sit white cities of gold up in the mountains. These mountains get so much rain, no one goes there. Um, and uh, it, their biggest problem is getting the president of the country to approve it. So they take this little plane, they make a hole in the bottom of it, and they put this LIDAR machine which bounces down billions of light rays and they bounce back up and the computer catches them and can tell what they're bouncing back from. And so the plane goes back and forth across this giant valley up there, sort of about the size of Manhattan. And um, at the end of three days, it has removed all the organic material. And you're, you have a map of a, a gigantic city, the buildings, the streets, the aqueducts, the whole thing. There it is, three days. How many days would that take? Well, it's taken three centuries and no one had found this thing, let alone developed it, I mean, in this sense, in three days. So who knows if this is right, but the New Yorker estimates that that, that LIDAR has now done away with 75% of what field archaeologists were doing. It's a great article. I recommend it to you. It a, the, the Atlantic did a, a, a short version of this big article. I you, story after story, it's just obvious. Intellectual repetition jobs are going away faster and faster. If you are not a change maker, if you think you're, I mean, I was in a car with an eight-year-old guy who, who I asked him, what is he going to do? He's going to be a truck driver. No, <laughs> no. But, you know, we still have all this in our heads. So people have to be change makers. Empathy-based ethics, teamwork, a completely different type of leadership. You're not telling people what to do and having incentives, positive and negative, and you don't have walls. You have to have this constantly changing, fluid, overlapping team of teams where everyone is as initiatory as a basketball player. Your leadership is now envisage, enable, ensure, helping the whole group envisage together, helping everyone help everyone else to be a better player and the group to be a better player, helping everyone organize a new organization which is going to have to change tomorrow. Well, that's a very, very different type of leadership. It's more powerful, not less powerful, but if you try the old leadership in this new situation, you're out. And if you can't do change making and be able to see over the horizon and help people imagine, where, how are you going to do this? So empathy-based ethics, teamwork, new leadership, change making, four skills you've got to learn and practice and practice. Uh, and you've got to organize differently in this fluid, open team of teams. Now that applies to every organization, every human being. When you have a fundamental pattern change, go through a turning point like this, on the one hand, it's challenging. On the other hand, what an opportunity for the people in this room. You wouldn't be here if you weren't already sensing it and seeing it. 
And it's just been so powerful us, once we're able to articulate this and see it relatively clearly, then it becomes pretty obvious what you've got to do, where the opportunities are, where you can really make a big contribution. Uh, so now think about this, the nature of this world. It is a much, much better world. First of all, there is no way the problems outrun the solutions when everyone is a competent, skilled, uh, driven by empathy-based ethics for the good of all world. We're all really smart, well-motivated white blood cells, and we leave our, lead our lives. You see, anyone sees anything, you say, oh, this is terrific. I know what to do, and everyone knows how to play with this. So it is a, ju just, you're, you can't even compare the effectiveness of this new world with the old one. Second, Everywhere we've been in the past has been very unequal. I will quote a former dean of the Harvard Business School welcoming, welcoming the incoming students um, class. Uh, most people don't even know that there's a game going on. And then very few people know how to play the game. You will leave this business school being really good at playing this game. Well, regrettably, the dean was right. Most people are not in the game, they can't play the game, and mysteriously, if only a few people have the power to play the game, they have all the power, all the chips. And that's been the story for most of human history, um, especially as we've moved into more larger societies. Now, when everyone is a change maker, and we all need one another in this team of teams, it's not perfect, but it's structurally a lot more likely to be a fair, more equal society. Then the third point, which is very, very profound. All of us here have the privilege. We were given things growing up. My parents, for example, I didn't know what they were doing at the time. But I now know in retrospect, they kept asking me, well, what, how do you think so-and-so felt when you did that? Well, that was a really big gift. They were helping me master empathy-based ethics. You wouldn't be here if you weren't given those sorts of gifts. Uh, well, not everyone is. In fact, most people aren't. Uh, and it's very hard for us to imagine what it's like to grow up without these skills and with, with the fear. How, how does it feel when you're living in a world you don't understand that's changing faster and faster and the rules, the things you've been using become less and less, less, and less useful? It's really threatening. Um, if in 10 years, the repetitive jobs that you thought was your future, not to mention your present, go away. This is really terrifying. Now, so uh, this world, once we get there, everyone gets to be a change maker. They get to be able to express love and respect in action and at a significant level. That's the gift we have. Now, it is wrong, it is a terrible thing to allow the world to continue where only a few people have that gift. And in an everyone a change maker world, everyone has that gift. Um, it's the most important gift. The prophets told us and the scientists now tell us that expressing love and respect in action is what gives you health, longevity, and happiness, clearly. So this is a much better world. We're right at the turning point, and everyone here can make a big contribution. First of all, for yourself. How are you doing on these skills? Your friends, your family, how are they doing? Uh, just give you a simple example. If you've got a six-year-old you love, and she hits her younger brother, what an opportunity you have. You have rules and enforcement, stand in the corner, whatever. But you can also put your arm around that six-year-old and say, well, how do you think your brother felt? My, my parents did this to me a lot, as I mentioned. Well, 
in that doing that, that simple thing, which anyone can do, you're helping that six-year-old master the foundational skill, empathy-based ethics, that she must have not to be marginalized in this world. If a 15-year-old friend says to you, something is a mess, put whatever you're doing down for God's sakes and help that person. Well, how, do you, how would you fix that? Oh, that's an interesting idea. Well, why don't you get your friends together and do that? Who, me? No, you can do this. And by the way, this is really important, and this is why it's important. If you want to be a powerful contributor, you've got to have the skills, and this is what I'll give you. Forget piano practice. Go for this. I mean, we can all help one another in different ways um, on this. And then there's the other dimension. This is a constantly growing, as we were told earlier, university, a business school that has a number of people focused on this. Um, universities can play a very big role. Um, just think about this new paradigm for growing up for a moment. Well, we need better measures of empathy in kids than bullying rates. That's pathetic. This university could help us get better measurements. That would really help the whole change. That's an opportunity for researchers, for teachers, for students. There are so many others. Once you see these big changes, by definition, you don't have 5,000 people who've already researched every point. It's, you know, it's a new frontier. A new frontier is a big opportunity. Um, and of course, any university that gets ahead of one of these curves is in a position to leapfrog ahead of the stuffy old universities that can't be bothered, that aren't entrepreneurial. Same, so they can say the same thing for a company. Uh, so for any group that you care about, your religious house, your business, do the people in that group see that this moment of change is here? Can they envisage, can you help them envisage what a fluid open team of teams would be like and help people get through that transition? That is the biggest strategic change you can make. I remember Bob and I had lunch, I don't know, five, six months ago, and he was, I, I, I hope I'm not revealing some secret here, but uh, he said that five years ago, strategy was uh, thinking about a 5% reduction in packaging costs. And now, who knows what the new business system is coming at us from God knows where. We have to be thinking at a wholly different level. Well, yes, everyone, every organization has to do that. And that's a, a great thing if you know how to do it and you're, you're doing it. So this is a profound, probably the most profound historical turning point. It's a really good turning point. But it's a turning point and you can't afford to miss it. And boy, if you see it and get on it and really help it along, what a wonderful opportunity to express love and, res and respect in the biggest scale. So thank you all very much for being at the cutting edge here. <laughs>